There he is. Look, uh, look at him. Uh, look at him. Look at that face. Uh, doggy on my voice. Look, look uh, at him. Doggy on a Thursday. Uh, look at him. He, yes, sir. He is delighted. His hair looks like he just rolled out of bed. What the hell yeah. is happening? You seem and look crazed at all times, but never more so than right now when it looks like your hair's trying to get away from you. And my makeup person, Danny, hasn't shown up yet. I got the baseball show in an hour, so she'll be here at 1015. <laughs> if I knew I needed my hair done for you guys, I would have had it here at 930. But uh, here I am, <laughs> raring to go. And I'm better with the hair crazy anyway. It makes yeah. me crazy, which is better radio. Uh -huh. How things going? Things good? Excellent. We are always happy to see you. The MLB Network show he's talking about is high heat. Every week he's on first take, and he headlines, of course, Mad Dog Sports Radio on Sirius XM, including Mad Dog Unleash weekdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. He's a pioneer in this industry, practically can be uh, credited with inventing the industry. He did invent the industry, Dan. And uh, here he is today with New York mattering in basketball the way it hasn't in a long time. Can you explain to the audience the link between Knicks basketball and that city and why, because it's in the city, it seems like that city loves that team more than any other when it does this. It just hasn't given it many chances to feel the way that it does today. Uh, excellent point. You hit it right in the head. I mean, that 69-70 Nick team is one of the famous teams in New York in all the sports. I put the Jets in there the year they beat the Colts. I put maybe the, um, you know, probably the 96 Yankees who surprised everybody. Maybe the 86 Mets. But... That 69-70 Nick team, uh, you know, with Frazier, DeBusher, Bradley, Reed, um, and uh, Barnett was a much valley, much valley old team, and everybody loved them. Uh, you know, the basketball in New York, obviously, the, the original franchise in the mid-40s. This was a great college basketball town for a long time. That kind of went away with CCNY, with the scandals there in 1551 when they won the NCAA and the NIT in the same year, but... Obviously, you know, uh, cheated because the points uh, shaving scenario and then the NBA, you know, hit the forefront. Knicks were bad for the first 20, 25 years. Then they drafted uh, Frazier. They drafted um, Willis from Grambling. Holtzman was the head coach. And they had that four or five year run there where they were great. Then they were bad uh, for a long time. Then they won a lottery with Ewing. Then Riley came in. Riley for the four years, he was superb. Everybody loved Raleigh, lost to Game 7 at Houston, and then Van Gundy had a great run, too. But for the most part, it's been very sporadic Knicks success. But this team, uh, in the last couple of years, they love. Everybody loves Brunson. Uh, Rosen did a great job. The general manager, Leon Rose, uh, Leon, Rose uh, Leon Rose, did a great job. It was a Rose and a Rose, whatever his name is. Did a great job. <laughs> it's Rose, him. doggy. Don't worry. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a superb a superb job by Thibodeau. Uh, Deep Vincenzo, people love him. J uh, Josh uh, Hart is a tremendous Villanova player who loose balls, hustles, offensive rebounds. Hartenstein, I mean, this is the kind of a Nick team they love. Yep. They would prefer defense over offense. They like the scrappy instead of the finesse. Uh, and this is kind of what you see here as far as this Knicks team is concerned. And that there's a, there's a, and, uh, now listen, Nick, the Knicks are not the football. It's not the NFL. I understand that. It's the NBA, which is, it's not the NFL. It's not Jets or Giants. But this is, um, everybody's totally in love with the ball club. I mean, and every game they play is a close game. That's the other thing. They never get blown out, and they never blow anybody else out. So there's always high drama at Madison Square Garden. Think of the seven playoff games that they played so far to date. They're, they're obviously, the six or the eight now, six and the two. Every game has been a tremendous game. There's some drama, some comebacks. Next, these two fourth quarters here in this series against the Pacers. Then the Sixers series with the calls at the end of the game, uh, two, when they didn't have five calls and Maxi lost the ball. All right, Mad Dog, Mad Dog, I'm going to cut you off here because I, I, know I, I need to cut him off just real quick because what? Jeremy, Jessica, and Chris all just said in my ear, what the f*** is just happening? Because there's been a hot, WFAT? I there's mean, been a there, no, history. This is the, the Chris. I'm going to talk. Cook. I, I, I will let him cook. In a, I will let him cook in a second. Cook some more in a second because we're going through the whole history of this. But I've seen this happen to Stephen A. Smith, and I've seen it happen to Max Kellerman. You get on first take, and he's been doing radio for years. But you get specifically on first take, and you got 45 minutes of news, but you got to talk for two hours. All of a sudden, you're a hijacker. You're somebody who can't stop talking. You're somebody who revs. Tell me I'm wrong, Russo. Tell me I'm right. wrong. You're right. 
<laughs> no, doggy, doggy, he's raw. <laughs> no, he's the great. He is the greatest. But everyone here was yeah. expecting him at some point to stop talking, and he wouldn't. No, Dan, that was a great history lesson. My doggy, my grandpa was actually the manager of one of those teams that played CCNY in 1951. Wow. He would have been 102 this year. <laughs> oh my God! How about that? Yeah, they, 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 you know they, you know they beat Kentucky and they, you know they had a, a DePaul. I mean they did a great job. They they won. They beat Bradley in both title games. Anyway, to make a long story short, the fascination with the Nick, the Knicks, the Nick crowd likes his kind of team. Hustle, feisty, offensive rebounds, play good defense. Brunson's a little guard. Everybody is shocked how well he has played. That was a tremendous move by Lee, by by Rose bringing him in here with a great contract. And this is a fun team. Now, I think they're going to get mauled by the Celtics when they get there. But I thought they beat Indiana in seven. Now it's probably going to be a little earlier than that. I thought they beat Philly. There's something about the team. Uh, uh, dog, dog, There's something about the team. Dog, I'm trying not to get caught up at the moment, but I have Jalen Brunson as the greatest Nick of all time. Do you agree? No, he's not. What? I mean, what? Uh, he's not better than Frazier. He's not better than Reed. You can't put him ahead of, obviously, uh, Ewing, that's three. He's not Dave DeBusher, that's four. Huh? But, you know, he's. you can make an argument anywhere after number f- the fourth one, ah. you can put Brunson in there. You can make that <laughs> but, argument. But wait a minute, though. These stats, are you not allowing, I guess, because of the modern game being so different? Because what Brunson has done, uh, those playoff performances are unprecedented in Nick's history. There's no such thing. 40, they, but, but remember, the other guys I've given you, you know, they were in finals. I mean, Ewing was in... Uh, you know, was in a final. Uh, obviously, DeBusher, Bradley, uh, DeBusher, Frazier, and Reed won two championships. Uh, he's only won two playoff rounds. You're right, the 40 point thing is phenomenal, but I, I'm looking at it from the team and the big picture of what the team did. If Knicks go win a championship, we can put Brunson one. But he's doing it in the second round of the postseason. So that's why I, that top four guys is tricky. To Busher, Clyde, Reed, and, and Ewing. I mean, geez, that's a hard top four to crack. To Busher was a tremendous Nick. He was the missing piece of, of with the Howard Comeyes trade. He was the missing ingredient that fit like a glove with that Nick team that won two titles. I can't put Brunson over to Busher. That's not fair. Dog, the dog. Busher averaged 18. The Busher averaged 18 points a game and guarded the best offensive player on the other team, and they won two titles. I can't put Brunson over him. That's dog, not fair. Dog, you mentioned first of all. Great talking to you as always. Dog, you're mentioning some great all-time Knicks. A bunch of them sit in the front row for these games. Some of them I feel like maybe should be more like the second or the third row. Like Stephon Marbury, teams were terrible. Marbury gets front row at the garden. Come on. Good point. Come on. I would You're love. Right. I would good love. Point. I would no, point. but I would love. First of all, that's the point. that's the highest honor when yes, Chris Russo point. tells you you made a good point. Yep. But do you realize that if you talk to him the way that you Rest. talk, which is like him, and you guys got into an argument, it would seem like you two were arguing with a mirror. I don't want to argue with Dog. I agree with everything he says. That's yes. my guy. I'm not going to argue with Dog. What are you talking about but here? For the sake I'm of not radio, always I mean. right. Let's take it easy. <laughs> I'm not always right. Yes, uh, you are, Dog. But uh, listen, you want to put Brunson fifth? Go ahead. You can put him fifth. Thank you. I can't put him. Appreciate yet. it. And listen, it. the Pacers are going to have some moments in this series. They'll bounce back some. I'm down on Carlisle. What, are you going to send 78 film clips to New York, <laughs> to the NBA office because of calls? When you blew a nine-point lead in game one and a 12-point lead in game two, and now you're going to send clips to the – and you're going to talk about small market, big market? Uh, the Spurs won five championships. Uh, what, a San Antonio, a big market all of a sudden? <laughs> that was weak. That was very weak. Uh, and the Nick fans going to love picking on Carlisle now. The Pacers, if the Pacers are going to be honest with themselves, they should have won one of these two games, for crying out loud. They should have won one of these two. Doggy, you're absolutely right. By the way, it was Duquesne, and I think my grandpa might have been the only Italian man there who wasn't point shaving. But I enjoy the history lesson, and I think maybe our audience would like to put it in context of maybe just the last 20 years because I, I think you're going a little too far back here with your, with your comps. Jalen Brunson is the best Knicks player since when? Uh, so I, you know, I'll say since Ewing has that. That's fair. fair. We'll live with that one. But yeah. look, yes, uh, but we're going to put on the screen, see if you can see this here. You're telling me that this was better than Jalen Brunson. I just want to be. Come on, Doug. Be fair. Be fair. Be fair. Where's his bicep? Did you know when Julius Serving was a net 
And the first day of the merger, the Knicks and the Nets played an exhibition game, which is a big deal, in New York. And do you know that the Busher completely shut Julius Irving down? Yeah. The Busher was great. Yeah. Now, listen, it's a little too far back. I get it. Mm -hmm. So we'll put Brunson since the early 90s. And nobody loves Riley more than me. And I, those Nick teams are rugged. Oakley, Mason, Ewing, Starks, Derek Harper, Anthony. Those are Name rugged teams. Xavier McDaniel. Oh. We love those teams in New York. And I'm not a Nick fan, but the fan loves those teams. And let's face it. I mean, they probably came as close as you can come to winning a championship. They lost a game seven. Uh, they played the Bulls in a game seven. You remember one thing about the Bulls? Bulls played two game sevens, Jordan did, in his career in the postseason when he won. Not when he lost to Detroit, when he won. And one game seven was against Indiana. And the other game seven, that first year with Raleigh with the Knicks. So we will put Brunson ahead of everybody since since Ewing will put him number one. I think that makes everybody happy. Dog, dog, let's be honest here for a second. Watching that broadcast last night, true or false, you would have thought that Reggie Miller was undefeated against the New York Knicks in his career. That's a good point. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Two, of them. Reggie, Two of them. Two of them. I love Reggie. He scored the 25 in the fourth quarter in that one game, in game six. He made the, you know, the eight points there. Let's take it easy. I mean, Reggie didn't win 20 championships. The, the Nick nemesis is more Jordan than who beat the Knicks millions of times. It's more Jordan than Reggie. And Reggie loves this, but Reggie's almost taken too much credit for being, uh, you know, the ultimate quote-unquote Nick killer. Uh, take it easy, Reg. Jeez. Sassy. And remember, in the one year when he scored the 25 in the fourth quarter, Knicks led 11, start of the fourth quarter. Reggie mm -hmm. had 25. The Pacers lost the series. Yeah. They lost the series. You tell them, They bro. didn't win that series. They lost game six in Indiana. He had 16 points. I was there for that game, and he did nothing in game seven. He lost the series. Too much love for Reggie. Uh, the idea that he is the, the ultimate, and I love Reggie, I'm a fan, Man. but way too much love. This man and his fandom, uh, this man and his comedy can run dark. He can run dark, but look at him right now. He is radiant. This is as radiant as you will ever see this man. He's the commissioner of fandom. He was courtside last night. He has shows coming up in Kentucky, Southern California, Atlantic City, Rochester, and Doral. Same time tomorrow is the Netflix special. And these moments for you keep getting sweeter because all the things you believe about heart and grit and underdog play out for you where you can be scared in the first half. And then what comes limping out of the locker room, tiny little Willis Reed. I, I can't act like I wasn't scared. The, the energy was out of the building. I took my brother last night. We were like, we, did we just lose Jalen Brunson? He comes back. The, the building goes crazy. And he was like, settle down. He didn't know if he was ready yet. Somehow Brunson Willis Reed it on, on the 54th anniversary of Willis Reed. He, he pulled a Willis Reed. It was epic. Uh, you know, all these complaints from the uh, Pacers, Rick Carlisle saying the officiating's bad. You can't beat the Knicks when we've lost more men than the Korean War. A new Nick is going down every day. And we're still finding ways to win. OG Ananobi, we pray he's okay. We, we don't know how bad this is going to be. Brunson comes on one leg and beats the Pacers. Stop whining. You're getting stomped. You have been telling me for, <laughs> for months now, since they made the Anunnabi trade, that uh, that guy changes everything about what that team was before he got there. Yeah, I mean, he's a 3 and D guy, but he's more. I mean, you saw what he did last night. It sucks he got injured because that was the OG Anunnabi game. He was completely taking over. He was showing you his offensive repertoire. I saw someone post... Uh, Ice Spice is in the house. He turns into 2019 Kawhi Leonard, and that's what he looked like. He looked freaking great. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we know what OG is capable of, but it's a team effort, you know? Josh Hart has been the uh, just the motor all game, every game. Dante shot the lights out. Hardenstein, one of the best passing bigs in the NBA. I mean, Brunson just it's like the energy in the building changed. Like we didn't have anything to cheer for in that second quarter because we were scared. He comes back and he made us believe like he's made us believe all season long. Sam, he, here's, here's what I want to know. You're a huge fan and you're sitting in the front row there. All right. Last night at the garden, 
how do you not run onto the floor and like hug players? And if I was there, somebody would have to hold me back. How do you not, how do you control yourself from running on the floor and celebrating after a big shot? Because I want to go back. That's the only thing keeping me from celebrating. I don't want, I don't want to pull up crazy. Although Hardenstein came over to try to high five me and my friend Chris Stefano was in the way. And Hardenstein DM'd me after the game. I tried to say what's up, but some dumbass was in front of you. Chrissy D. I to Chris, I was like, you called me a high five. Well done. <laughs> okay, so you were in the front row, and here's something I need to understand. If you're in the yeah. front row at the garden, you're big time, obviously. All right. What if your age I want to know the process of getting the front row at the garden for a playoff game? Because if your agent calls you and says, hey, I got your tickets for tonight, you're in the third row. You're a loser then, Sam. So what's the process of getting the first oh. row tickets? Well, I don't care where I sit, man. I sat in the handicap section the other game. I don't I don't care. Like, <laughs> I just want to be in the building. So I, I every time I've asked them for tickets, they've said yes. You know, I've, I've known them for a while. I play all their venues, the MSG venues. You know, I did the theater there. I did the Beacon. I've done the Chicago theater. It's all MSG. So I think I think they're like, oh, he's, he plays a lot of our venues. He's a diehard fan. We like him. So they're nice enough to hook up tickets. When I ask, but I don't want to over ask because I'm grateful. Right. And, and I don't take it for granted. But aren't there like whispers where if, if a celebrity is sitting in like the second or third, or like, oh, look at that guy. He's kind of a loser. No, I'm turning around and high fiving everyone in sight. Yeah, but Sam, you know this is a status symbol. Yeah, that's what I mean. Garden. You know it is. Like, if the Knicks told you, hey, Sam, we're putting you upstairs, you're not going to the game. I mean, come on. I was just in the handicap section. Yeah. You know what I said? That was Brad's fault, though. They don't listen. That was Brad's Brad. fault. Sam, and that's been... a decent section. I got to be honest. Uh, Sam, been... they've been in sports radio a long time. Neither one of them listened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a huge fan, and I used to sit in the 400s, and I'll still gladly go to the 400s. I just want to be in the building for the, for the madness. I, I just love the team, so I don't care. What I'm an sure. everyman. <laughs> let me let me put up on the screen here this image because Brunson hit a shot early in the fourth quarter, oh, uh, so and good. you see Chris DiStefano between you. You you see there's someone reaching out to dap and just uh, to dap Brunson, and he stares at them there. What is happening there? Did you make fun of the fact that Brunson uh, stiffed him there? Well, here's the thing. That's Chris's friend Tommy the cop. That guy's like. 350 pounds of pure muscle. You know, <laughs> Tell me the cop. That, that guy nearly, like, he would chest bump me, and I was like, I think I broke a rib. Like, this guy's a lunatic, you know? So that's one of Chris's old-timey buddies, and uh, he, he, Brunson did the right thing not taking that high five. The force this guy has could have broken a finger or something. So good move from, from Jalen, just staring us down. We, we knew what was up. Uh, Sam, enough of Reggie Miller. No? Did you say anything to him? If I saw him, I would have said uh, what everyone else in the building was saying. I joined the chant, of course, because uh, we all hate Reggie. And the fact that he's calling the broadcast, yeah. the fact that TNT is so anti-Knicks. Like, I'm sorry, Charles. I don't know what the Knicks fans did to you. We all just love our Knicks. By the way, we're underdogs. We, everyone, they may have chosen the Knicks to win, but not with all these injuries. We lost Mitchell. We lost Boyan. We lost, uh, you know... Julius Randle, of course. And now uh, we don't know how long OG is going to be out. And from, for some reason, they're just like taking joy and rooting against us. We are we are badass and we have heart and we play with resilience. Show us some respect. We What is this anti-Knicks broadcast? I feel like I'm watching like an anti-America broadcast in North Korea or something. <laughs> this is the Knicks. We got a great <laughs> fan base. Let's, uh, let's play some of that sound here for Sam to maximum agitate him. You know, if the Knicks win, that'll be good. You care who wins. Cut it out. I don't care who wins, yeah, but I will tell you what. I would love to see them get their ass stomped by the Celtics. That'd be great. <laughs> then you care who wins. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, whoever whoever wins this series is going to get stomped by the Celtics. Oh, you know. said you'd be happy to see I, it. Yeah, because yeah, the New Yorkers, y'all deserve it. Because y'all think y'all the greatest thing since sliced bread. Tell them, Chuck. Come on, y'all ain't that good in New York. What else, Chuck? Come on, man. Y'all overrated. What else, Chuck? It's because y'all make good pizza and good bagels. And what else, Chuck? And what else, crime? And hold on, Chuck. Don't forget about the... So, you know, they, they can't, I ain't going to say anything bad about the street meat. I love, the street meat. <laughs> I, love, I love the street meat. Yeah, we can tell you love the street meat, Chuck. Why don't you cut down on some of it? <laughs> Secondly, we do have great pizza and great bagels. I appreciate the compliment. And look, I'm a Charles Barkley fan. How could you not be? But enough with this hatred on New York. I'm sorry. Is it, did it stem from when we swept your ass in the 80s when you played for the Sixers and demanded a trade? Is that when it came from? 
I don't know why he hates the Knicks fans so much. We've been a star for greatness franchise, and we finally have greatness in Jalen Brunson. Put some respect on the Knicks' names, Charles. We're doing this injured. We're doing this next man up style. Precious stepped up. Badass game defensively from Precious. Give it a break. And hopefully, I can't believe I'm saying hopefully we get ESPN the next game, but at least maybe we'll have Mike Breen, a great broadcaster, calling the game instead of a <laughs> putz boy. like Reggie Miller. Yeah. Get oh, Reggie off no. the broadcast. Oh, you, no. Yeah. Oh, no. It kind of like falls flat to be like, New York, what do they have other than really good pizza, really good bagels, really good yeah. food carts? It's yeah. like, it it's like you ever get, you see those memes about Boston that's like, oh, Boston. The weather's terrible, the traffic's bad, but at least the food sucks too. You never say that about New York. It's good. I don't hate, I, I had great times in Boston actually. Like, I, look, I hate the Celtics, but I don't dislike Boston as a city. Uh, I take my last special in Boston for the new one I just shot. I love Boston, but I will say uh, New York is the best city in the world. And you don't have to agree with me, but there's, even if you don't like New York, you have to admit we're in the conversation. So I don't know what he's talking about. No arenas rocking like the Garden. It's just not. I do enjoy, though. This is the part that has to hurt you as someone who loves the NBA so much. Uh, there is very little better on television than Shaq continually throwing lobs to Barkley until he gets what he wants and then dissolving in laughter when, when he finally gets Barkley to just say how much he likes street meat. Look, I I love Shaq and Barkley. Like, how could you not love this crew? Like, we don't want this crew to be... And I'm a Knicks fan. I, all they do is hate on us. All they do is doubt Brunson. And, and the hatred that they threw at Brunson, it was fuel. I think he just kept getting better because his whole career has been people doubting him. Uh, this Knicks team has a chip on its shoulder, so keep doubting us, please. I love it. Keep throwing uh, fuel to the fire. But... I, I can't deny that I don't love this broadcast. It's like they were like the original podcast. They're great together, and, and I hope they don't get broken up. The garden's cool and all, but Ammer and Bank Arena last night. It was, sunrise was lit. Oh, last night. Oh, your six to one. Ooh, Ice cats. That's baby. right. Pop Panthers took down, that ass baby. last night. That's all right. right. All right. All right. Just oh, exactly, dude. They where do they shoot? Atlanta. Go to a Hawks game. Tell me how uh, lit that is. Um, the garden's were... worth that. I don't think Sam was less than uh, Yes, there. it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. uh, Sam, your shirt. Uh, tell me about how much Knicks gear Lance you have. How, uh, how much Knicks gear you have. Uh, what uh, Are you wearing anything else these days? Well, no, not really. I, I, I have to decide between all these Knicks shirts. I've had to give some away because I'm moving upstairs in this building. So I, like, I'm going through stuff. I'm like, I have too much Knicks stuff. i got to spread the wealth. I, I've given some out to friends. Uh yeah, no, it's all, it's all Nick stuff all the time. You're moving on up to a deluxe I'm apartment actually, in the, the sky. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually using an alias at the Comedy Cellar right now because they got mad at me because the, the schedule didn't come out in time for the playoffs. So I would just keep canceling every Knicks game. And they got they have to email every person who shows what? up. So I, I now you can alienate to the comedy cellar until the playoffs are over. I like it. What uh, what are your favorite uh, things at the Knicks game outside? Like in terms of touches, whether it's uh, you know music, anything that they're doing to accent your courtside experience. Winning. Winning is the best. I mean, we got to say what's up to Frazier last night, and and like. You know that Walt Frazier to me is the coolest dude ever. Like just the 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 outfits, the vibes, the way he speaks. He's so humble. I love Walt Frazier so much. Uh, Sabathia, dapped up Sabathia, another New York legend. So uh, I love that. And that song that comes on, that's like na 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 na. That's, <laughs> that's our song. Like what we play here. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I had enough of you taking our team. Cool song. Oh, and whenever they go, like, when do they hit you with, go New York, go New York, go, when we go on a run? Yeah, I mean, honestly, nothing gets us more fired up than Josh Hart grabbing a loose ball. That's what New York fans love. It's, <laughs> oh, it's the you know, best, we, yes. We remember Oak and, and Charlie Ward just diving into the stands all day. So when we see <laughs> Josh Hart, just – that motor, man. And Hardenstein grabs so many loose balls, too. That's why we miss Mitch right now. He was hey, great yo. at that as well. But, yeah, we love this team so yeah. much. So I get so so pumped up. When is the last time, and I know I've asked you forms of this before, but when is the last time that it felt this way for you? Because I don't know that there's anything that in sports, one. In sports that would feel <laughs> this way. That, I mean, this team. I don't – yeah, the Sixers series had some of that, too. But I'm saying – 
the, you have not gotten joy from your fandom with this team, Sam. They've hurt you a lot. Yeah, I think it's been like 26 years, probably. Uh, I was, I was definitely, uh, I was definitely pretty young for the last one. But that that run we went on last time, we were an eight seed, so it kind of came out of nowhere. We knew we had Miami in the first round, that that Allen Houston floater, and like, oh, come on. there's something about a rivalry. <laughs> Whenever it's a rivalry, the seeds don't matter as much. You know, I'm right though. I mean, you see what Miami did to the Celtics last year. Like, when it's two teams that kind of go at each other's throats, I feel like the seeding isn't as important. So we look good that, and we had a tough team um, that year. You know, just skill, but also like really tough. LJ was really tough. Uh, Spree was really tough and skilled. But Brunson has climbed to the top of your emotional list, correct? Brunson is at the very top of uh, Nick's positive feelings. He says every right thing. I mean, I don't think he could handle the press any better. Josh Hart is hilarious with the press. I feel like he's always trolling. I mean, these guys are very lovable. There's something about them. You can't not love this group. They are. They play with a lot of humility. They play with a lot of grit. And I feel like they represent New York City very well. Like We really love them. And I think this is a basketball town. You walk a few blocks, you can't not see a basketball court. Everyone here plays basketball and loves basketball. So uh, this team just plays the right way. It's corny, but it's true. They really do play unselfishly they play hard ass d i mean this is what new yorkers love and they say all the right things to the press so we can't not love this team i know you showed great restraint by not running onto the floor when you were super excited last night but if if like someone for the pacers gooned it up uh, and knocked over jalen brunson like would you run on the floor and you know make sure that <laughs> okay look you know. if they injured brunson further would I Nancy Kerrigan, Tyrese Halliburton? Possibly. <laughs> I can't say I wouldn't. I mean, that's just, that's how it goes. An eye for right. an eye. Yeah. Respect. Sam, I have not cleared this with Dan, but if the series gets back to the Mecca for game five, if it gets back, uh, I'm thinking I'm coming up here. Uh, I'm coming up to the game. I want to go courtside with you. What do you think? Can we make it happen? <laughs> I don't know if they're going to give me two in a series. <laughs> uh, I, I want Tommy the cop there. Would uh, you, you sit in the handicap spot? No. Who's in the handicap spot together? No, Tommy so the cop is uh that I did not get a lot of leg room from that guy. That was tough. Right. <laughs> but me and you courtside next week? Huh? Well, I'll try. All right, good. Uh you're not gonna try, and I don't want you to try, and he embarrasses me all the time. Anytime anyone comes on the show with power, he just asks for things. If Sam tells me he has courtside, I'll be there. That's all I can tell uh, him. Nah, uh, we don't know with you. Debatable. Scott. Yeah, you he just told you he doesn't uh, though. You, so. It doesn't matter what you say. Those words are empty and meaningless. Hi, Mina. Hey. Have you ever seen Airplane? The movie Airplane? Yeah. A long time ago. Why? I don't know. Do you think it's funny? I watched it when I was a child and I thought it was funny, but I don't know if I would find it funny as an adult. It's been a long time. Probably. We were talking before you came on, Mina. It's nice to see you, as it always is, about whether comedies from the 70s can possibly hold up and whether Airplane, which uh, has more jokes per minute than any movie in the history of movies, would be something. Obviously, uh, you have to grade on a curve for the time. Some of the stuff is going to be permissible there that would be offensive now. But uh, when... So it's not going to hold up that way, but just in mm. general... Will you stop on any kind of 70s movie and stay there for a while? Because, for example, Jaws holds up for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll watch dramas and action movies from the 70s. I rarely watch old comedies generally, I think. That's pretty common, right? Um, sometimes from the 80s, maybe. Uh, but that... Pretty rarely. Where where on your uh, timeline would a movie, uh, you know, because 70s is a long time ago, Airplane was 1980, but you, where right. on your timeline would you reference a an ancient or fossilized comedy and wonder whether or not it would still hold up today? I, it's funny because I think about this, right, now that I have a kid, I'm like, what movies from my childhood will I share with him? Um, and I think, 90s comedies ones that i grew up thinking were unbelievably funny like chris farley movies um but how much of that is actual humor versus nostalgia that illicit feeling of going to the movie theater alone for the first time to see i don't know black sheep or whatever 
I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I think it's probably a little bit, it's funny through the lens of me being a child when I watched it for the first time. But I will say uh, my, my husband had never seen like the Adam Sandler movies of our youth, my youth, Happy Gilmore, Billy Madison, which is very funny because so many of those um, like phrases and jokes from that movie have entered the lexicon. And we watched it as adults for the first time. And they're very funny. I know that's not that far back, but it is what I mean, when did Happy Gilmore come out or Billy Madison? Like yeah, mid-90s? Those are 2000s. No, early 2000s, early, I think. Or early yeah. 2000s. Oh, 90s. Oh, it was the 90s. Yeah. Like yeah. Mid-90s. That's old. That's 30 year. I mean, it's and, and I think. He was pretty young. Uh, yeah, I think they're still funny. I'll tell you what happens here, because I was very excited to show my kids comedies from my youth, and so I tried Stripes <laughs> Out. What you tend to do is build up the movie, because you loved it so much. And so okay. I did this with my kids, and I tried it out with Stripes and 48 bad, bad Hours. strategy, though. Dad Stripes. talking something up. Yeah, I talked it up too much. That's the problem. Worked That's what I'm saying. Airplane. <laughs> Would you call 48 Hours a comedy, though? It was. I mean... Wasn't it? Like, like Tootsie? Not, not really. Tootsie? Was I that tried a big out, one? I tried out Tootsie. I tried yeah. out. There were so many movies I tried out. I'm trying, what was Robin Williams when uh, he was dressed as the housekeeper? Mrs. Doubtfire. Mrs. Doubtfire. I tried that one out of my kids. They hated all of them. All of them. Mrs. Doubtfire? Yeah, hated it. You know what movie I'll be devastated if my child doesn't like? Uh, because it's probably my favorite movie of all time, Groundhog Day. With well, Bill Murray. Yeah. If he that's doesn't think that's funny. Of all time. What a quirky it. sense of humor to make that your favorite of all time. I mean, I'm not saying it's not funny. I really? liked it too, but to make it your favorite of all time, you have to have a quirky sense of humor. It's almost you know, obligated. You know what's odd? Two of the other movies of the last 10, 15 years that I've liked a lot. Um, one is Edge of Tomorrow, which is the Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt action movie that's basically Groundhog Day. And then I really liked, um, I think it was called Palm Springs, which was a Hulu movie. It was Great a TV movie. movie with it. Really good. But again, that's also the Groundhog Day premise. So maybe I just like the idea of people having to relive a single day over and over. My kids never want to watch movies that I recommend that I loved growing up, mid-90s, because they say it's too old, they don't want to sit down and watch it. And then I remember, oh, yeah, that'd be like if when I was their age, my dad wanted me to watch a movie from the early 60s. I never would have wanted to watch yeah, that movie. Movies are, I feel like movies have gotten way better. Like, I, you know, I mean, like, it, it, let's say if you go back even further, let's say you had a grandparent who's like, well, watch this movie from the 1940s. And I now people who are cinephiles are probably listening to this in absolute horror. They're like, how dare you not love, I don't know, whatever. Nosferatu. Falcon. <laughs> Nosferatu. <laughs> um, when I say better, I mean, they're certainly more, movies from the 90s and 80s are certainly more palatable to a modern audience than movies from the 40s, 30s, whatever were to people in the 50s and 60s, I think. Can you guys give me some assistance? I always thought uh, that Robin Williams, I thought uh, that uh, Miss Doubtfire was single. I did not know that she was married or widowed. I didn't know yeah, she was she's Mrs. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I didn't remember. I thought she was just single. It's I didn't okay. know. It's okay. I, no, it's not okay. It's look, at, look at the disgust on Mina's face because I would dare to think that she's Miss Doubtfire, not Mrs. Doubtfire. She's like horrified, as if I said something offensive. She wants an apology from me. Miss Doubtfire. I'm surprised they haven't remade it as Miss Doubtfire. And maybe like the new generation is she is single and maybe she has like a robust dating like. Maybe she's on the apps. <laughs> she's I don't on know. Tinder. Uh, put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Levitard Show. Miss Doubtfire or Mrs. Doubtfire. Well, See how many other people might line up with me in making this mistake. So, guys, if you think you showed uh, your daughters the Blues Brothers, would they laugh? Uh, no. No way. No, 48 wow. hours was probably a stretch. Beverly Hills Cop trading I mean, places. You should have seen their reaction when I tried Rambo out. I mean, first <laughs> blood. <laughs> Just because she's a Mrs. Doubtfire doesn't mean she's not still on the menu. Uh, Jessica, your Mrs. Doubtfire, your limited fake Mrs. Doubtfire was a oh. real revelation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yes, thank you for it's sharing. It's really David Cross <laughs> as Tobias Funke <laughs> as Mrs. Doubtfire. But thank you for sharing her or them with us. <laughs> Uh, Mina, I want to get to uh, some football here, but you love your uh, music, and Steve Albini uh, passed away, and uh, I would just like to get some of your thoughts there, uh, if you would share them with us. Yeah, I, I um, you know, my, my 
this really hit my husband hard, who I don't talk about this at all. He's a music producer. He's super influential on him. He was devastated to hear this. He had met him. Um, I think he's going to be writing about him. But for me personally, I, I, you know, I, there's the big albums we all know, obviously Nirvana, the Pixies, the Breeders. But when I saw the news, I just went down a rabbit hole of looking at his discography. And it's really interesting because uh, Albini often wasn't identified as a producer. He's just identified as a mixer, you know, the engineer on some of these albums. I think he had personal reasons for that. Um, but the list is so insane. Like it, it is like that Wilt Chamberlain meme of, you know, like the number, like it's, it's crazy how many incredible albums he had a hand in albums that were influential to me. And, and their albums, what I loved about looking at these lists and reading these retrospectives, they're albums where I didn't realize there was any connectivity between them. And then when you realize one man was involved in the sound behind them, suddenly you see this through line and, and you realize why, like, maybe, oh, maybe I'm not just a fan of McCluskey and Lowe and Super Chuck and the Cloud Nothings. Maybe I'm just a Steve Albini fan because he had a hand in all of these incredible albums. Um, just an unbelievable sound, unbelievable uh, impact on rock music, uh, post-punk, indie, and yeah, it's just, it, all I'll say is just look at the list, and I dare anyone to not find one or two albums that they love. Uh, Mina, a couple of things here on the Brady Roast. Did you enjoy it, and were you surprised that he opened himself up and, al <laughs> and did it? Al allowed everything yes. except jokes at the expense of Robert Kraft if and the massage parlor. I wonder what the DraftKings odds were on uh, Dan not being the first person to ask me about the Brady Roast and Netflix. <laughs> uh, here's 45 more minutes. Uh, no, just kidding, Dan. Um, yeah, I was there. Um, I was in the moment. I was like, whoa, they're really going for it, especially with the divorce stuff, the Giselle stuff uh, in particular going so hard on that. But when I kind of and, and I thought a lot of it was really funny. Um, you know, comedy is subjective, obviously, but I thought Nikki, I thought Kevin Hart was like surprisingly funny. I've never been a big Kevin Hart person. I thought Nikki Glaser was hilarious. I think that seems to be the universal reaction. Some of the later comedians I wasn't familiar with, uh, comedians who went later, I thought were pretty funny. But then when I sat back and I, and I thought about it, uh, they really, I don't, I don't want to say they pulled their punches, but there's a lot of stuff where I think Brady would have been more vulnerable on that they didn't go to. And instead, it was a lot of like, hey, guys, he seems gay, right? Like, from, especially from the teammates, which I don't think it hurts him at all to hear that. Um, like, I saw uh, Nikki was talking about one of the jokes she cut was on Brady getting work done on his face. There was one joke on that. I thought there was going to be a lot more on that, for example. Um, there's just a few topics I was surprised that didn't come up. And it seemed like by the end, it's like, okay, we're kind of going to the same well. But it was really funny on the whole. Drew Bledsoe told us that uh, Tom Brady getting up, because I thought that was a really fascinating peek at how power protects power. Tom Brady right. telling yeah. Jeff Ross, no matter who you think Jeff Ross is, and Jeff Ross has been in a thousand circumstances like this. Jeff Ross was very concerned that he crossed the line. The entire rest of the roast, he was thinking, did I cross the line uh, with Brady? Jeff, well, he obviously did. They and, made up afterwards. And I Drew guess. Bledsoe and everyone who was involved with it said that was not a scripted moment. Tom Brady was caught off mic in as about as honest a moment as you will find around the Patriots, where he is protecting only the owner and the shame of the owner on something that was a sex trafficking accusation that the owner uh, managed to make go away with all of his money and power for Tom Brady. This, this, I, the part that I thought was so clear and revealing about this is where athletes have confidence and where comedy uh, comedians have confidence, different places. A lot of comedians are insecure. A lot of athletes get to confidence and success and power. For Brady to cut through with, hey, no more of that. You saw Jeff Ross who is expert in that circumstance, mm. uh, bow. Like, okay, okay, okay. And I just yeah. thought that was a real interesting glimpse on how power protects power. Yeah, I don't know how the... I, I, that was also in the moment we were like, whoa, was this planned? And, you know, because it was a little bit off-putting. And I think at that point they had already done some pretty... You know, they had really gone after the divorce, for example, which, um, you know, y y I think that was obviously Brady knew that was coming. I'm sure it was discussed beforehand in some ways, but just that wasn't there. And it made me wonder, Dan, like if she was there, if he would have done the same thing, you know, I, I felt like probably he was involved in getting both Bill Belichick, but also Robert Kraft to come. 
And I, 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 in the moment I thought, oh, maybe he feels like, well, I told Robert Kraft to come to this and now, you know, this favor that I pulled in, you're attacking him and I feel bad because I called in a favor to bring him in. I don't know. It's weird. I mean, you know, the weirdest thing in professional sports is that they call owners Mr. And nobody else gets called Mr., uh, which feels like sort of a, a microcosm or I, I probably mean, it sort of reflects what we saw there. You understand why both Giselle and uh, Aaron Hernandez's family would be upset by uh, some of the fodder that became jokes. Did there. Hernandez's family come out and say stuff? Yeah, yeah. upset. Yeah, very upset. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the Giselle thing, I mean, it's... They didn't attack her. They sort of... The, the thrust of all the jokes was, ha-ha, Tom Brady, you've been cucked, right? Um... I don't want to say she doesn't have a right to be annoyed by having her name in the news and, and having, I guess, being a part of an event that she didn't, like, agree to be a part of. I don't know. I, I assume that her and Brady talked about it beforehand. But um, I don't feel like she was, like, attacked by it, personally. Give us your thoughts here. Chris Russo came on with us, and we've been making fun today of the fact that he had some trouble with jujitsu as a word. And I just want to get your analysis as we play this for you. What was happening with Chris Russo and a theory that Jessica has that I believe to be the most accurate one on what happened right here. How did he lose his beautiful wife to a jujitsu instructor? Uh, uh, how do you pronounce it? Jiu-jitsu? Jiu-jitsu instructor. I mean, that's the whole theme of the night, that she's going out with the jitsu instructor. <laughs> did he say jizu? Uh That's what he said initially. He yes. To a jizu instructor. I love his producer so, like, so confused. Jiu-jitsu? Jiu-jitsu? Jizu. <laughs> jizu sounds like a porn that uh, we shouldn't be talking about. She's going out with the jitsu instructor. Uh, play the whole thing again, because maybe you'll get a better clue here at the end on what Jessica's theory is that I believe is accurate. Okay. How yeah. did he lose his beautiful wife to a jujitsu instructor? Uh, to a, in, uh, how do you pronounce it? Jujitsu? Jujitsu instructor. I mean, that's the whole theme of the night, that she's going out with the jitsu instructor. Jitsu at the, the end. Yeah. What's your theory, Jessica? My, my theory was that he perhaps was confused and thought that his producer was saying it was a Jew jitsu instructor. A Jewish person who was partaking in jitsu. Okay, as opposed to someone who works at a zoo. Uh, the, uh, or or uh, kazoo or uh, anything related to a kazoo. To a jitsu instructor. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I ended up at the beginning. Does he think that it's somebody beaten to death by a kazoo? She's going out with the jitsu instructor. Because then at the end he just says the jitsu instructor. That's She's right. going out with the like, jitsu instructor. Like he's just afraid to say because he doesn't know how the first word well, is Well, there spelled. are jitsu instructors, then there are Jew <laughs> jitsu <laughs> instructors. Like, so I would be a Jew jitsu instructor. Same here, yes. <laughs> if I were a jitsu instructor, I'd be a Jew <laughs> jitsu instructor. Yeah. 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 To a jizu constructor. But you'd, a you'd be a jizu. Jiu jitsu instructor. I'd be, be a Jew jiu jitsu instructor. Right, but you'd also be a, a Jew jiu jitsu. Jiu -jitsu. Yes. Well, according to him, like, just Jew jitsu. Jiu jitsu is what happens when Stigatz interviews Ron McGill. Let's jizu. play the music here for. Uh, let me see here. <laughs> Football music for Mina so that we can speed her up and we can get maximum football information from her. Uh, let's start with Bryce Young. I uh, I said, and a lot of people have made fun of me for this, I'm like, mm. uh, they fast forwarded the timetable so much. These guys aren't going to get time if you need value at that position to prove itself quickly. I've seen enough to know that we're not going to allow that to mature to become the player that it might be. I think that we can make the evaluation now that that's not going to be special. Faster, Dan. Why am I wrong? Oh, you're saying it's you're you're done with young. It's over. I'm not done with young, but yeah, well, not all young people, just this young person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I um, I, I think you get two years now, right? I something that's like quite quietly I, I slept on a little bit is the Steelers. Um, how quickly that they moved on. They moved on from Kenny Pickett. He was first round draft pick and he wasn't horrible. He wasn't good. Uh, but 
I do think it's a new NFL where that regime was just like perfectly like ready to rip the Band-Aid and move on and keep going, at, which I think is probably the right decision, honestly. Um, but certainly something that didn't happen years past. Josh Rosen was kind of the exception, right, with uh, when they moved on from him in Arizona to draft Kyler Murray. But that was also because they had that draft pick. Steelers didn't have top draft pick and they still said, "Now nah, we're good. We've seen enough of Kenny Pickett. Um, I think where it gets tricky is a situation like Carolina where the circumstances were so awful, it is hard to de- sort of, you know, bifurcate Bryce Young's performance from how awful his receivers were, the sort of show around him. Uh, they did everything possible to reinvest, or to, pardon me, invest in the offense, spent a ton of money on the interior of the offensive line. You go out, you add a bunch of receivers, but it feels like after this year, uh, if it doesn't happen, it's not happening. And, and that, I think, is pretty unusual, or it's new, rather. Mina, did you hear what Austin Rivers was talking about? Football players playing basketball, basketball players playing football. What's your take on that? No, I didn't. That's a thing that people talked about in sports media? It's, it's May. You know how it is. It's May. It's a Perfect busy sports feel. time. It shouldn't dominate the landscape. It's plenty busy now. We don't have to have sports radio discussion <laughs> it's football. from 30 years ago. WFAT, Dano. And yet here we are. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a hot take on it. I haven't really seen all of the reactions, so I don't know if this is the common view. But um, my feeling is that neither would have success in either league, right? Certainly not 30 players. Obviously, he's talking about like current players switching leagues, I guess, having time to train and, and whatever. I think there's just too much skill and specialization required. Like the, the, the case for the basketball players, well, who I think do have a better shot just because of the numbers. There's three times as many, of course, active players, and you do have more specialized roles. But I think when we think about a basketball player playing in the NFL, we think about like a tight end, like LeBron James, Zion, whatever, switching to tight end and then just like posting up in the end zone and being a red zone target. Okay, fine, but that doesn't happen. In fact, tight end is a position that's so difficult to master in the league because of all that is required of it and the nuances of both blocking and all of that, that rookies rarely come in and make an impact. If rookies who have been playing this their entire lives uh, can't do it, what makes us think, you know, like 38-year-old LeBron James could do it? I, I don't think either would succeed. Well, me and Stu Gatz have cooked up a list of a team that we know will beat not only the Washington Wizards, but also the Charlotte Hornets. One through five. Are you ready? I'm ready. At our point guard, Tyreek Hill. What? Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill. Hooper. Just because he's fast? No, he's got an incredible three-point shot. Yep. Bully down does low. He? Yeah, he yes. does. Scored 61 points at a courtside game once. We did some research, yes. He's 5'10". Okay, wow, he's, yes. fi- he's really small. That's, That's fine, okay. Daniel. Yep. No, That's problem right. with that? No. Uh, two guard, C.J. Stroud. Is there a 5'10 player in the league right now? A uh, single 5'10 been... player in the league? How? Yeah, how tall is I say? Team is looking like. up for it. All right. Uh, right. CJ Stroud had 40 points on Jaime Hawkins Jr. in high school. How about that? Yep. Okay. How about like that. that? At okay. small forward, DK Metcalf. Oh, DK. <laughs> oh, he's he like celebrity that. basketball games. He always plays in like the Ruffles, Pringles, Fritos <laughs> game every year, I feel like, and does pretty well. All right, at the four, Max Crosby. <laughs> Have you seen him play basketball? <laughs> Why? <laughs> he's incredible. He's like a power, he? like he's he's incredible. I want you after we're done here, go okay. Google Max Crosby basketball. He's slamming on dudes at the park. He looks amazing. Real hoopers now. Okay. Thank oh, you. Yep. <laughs> and at center, Miles Garrett. Oh wow. Of course. Of course. Okay. So basically, you just chose like one. the strongest three guys for three, four, five. We like, have a guy just... off the bench, Hoopa Nakua. <laughs> does he? Does he? Hoop? Puka hoops? Ho- Puka Nakua no, is he wanted amazing. to just make a Hoopa Nakua joke. No, see, Dan, no. real hoopers know Puka Nakua, excellent yeah, basketball player. Joke. I need yeah, to help you out. This is crazy. Yeah, we got David you're, Bakhtiari you're, off you're, the bench, too. Your center's 6'4". <laughs> Miles Garrett is... Look, come on, You're, you're, you're going to get some offensive rebound problems with Tyreek Hill and your 6'4 center. Dan, please watch the screen right now. Watch Max Crosby. They're getting their asses He's playing with me. Watch. He's playing against me. <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, Tony, the, being in the NBA is hard. I know these guys are Man, great athletes. Uh, let We're me ask talking you, about beating the Hornets. Let me ask you this question, Amina, because multiple NFL teams have reached out to Olympic gold medalist Gable Stevenson 
uh, after he was uh, released by the WWE. He's 23. He's 6'1", 265 pounds. He went 67-2 and two in collegiate wrestling. Uh, these are different skill sets. Uh, yes, obviously, he's strong. That doesn't make him a football player, but football players are reaching out. So the evaluation of someone like this, uh, is it practical to think that a professional wrestler can be someone who's good at football? Yeah, it's practical to think that the NFL has so many players. And, and you know, when I say like there's 1,600, I think is if you do 32 times 53. Yeah, there's that. But then there's twice that. There's, there's all these guys that they just bring in to see. Is this somebody that we can work with? For example, there's the International Pathways Program. You always hear about uh, the NFL, like, oh, we found this guy in Germany. And he played soccer or rugby or whatever, hockey. Let's see if we can make something out of him. He's multiple clay, but it takes years. Years, I mean, you know, like for all these guys, and, and often when they do bring in players from other sports, we hear about them coming in and, and working out, and then nothing happens. You never see them on the field. It's so rare that you see one of these multi-sport athletes actually become something in the NFL. Zazlo, do you think that a sumo wrestler would make a good NHL goaltender? Oh my God, be pretty good. <laughs> Isn't that the? plot of Mighty Ducks, like just taking the biggest guy and Goldberg. Goal. By the way, Nate yeah. Ebner would like a word. You tell him, Tone. Uh, Lamar Jackson playing at 205 pounds. What do we think of that? So I, I was surprised to hear that, and it's something that's been on my mind because we, we talked about it with Jaden Daniels uh, in the pre-draft process. Is he too small? Because he's very slight, and I think probably weighs about that. I think he came in a little bit above that, probably in water weight at the combine or his pro day or whatever. Um, but that's that is skin skinny, and there's not that many uh, NFL quarterbacks who are that slim who have had success in the league. That said, Lamar Jackson's superpower, he has quite a few, but the one that I think of all the time isn't just his. It's not his straight line speed. It's the fact that he has this like prenatural ability to avoid hits how many times you watch him in the pocket and he's like weirdly kind of froggering his way through traffic and it feels like nobody can ever really square him up or get a hit on him Jaden Daniels is not like that that dude takes hits so I, I actually think it's probably not a big deal if it's a weight that he's comfortable with Lamar Jackson our backup two guard by the way that's exactly why you said is he he gets in the lane euro stepping by people Boom. great finish off the glass off the bench Again, you guys underestimate how good NBA players okay. are. You uh, underestimate how good so Lamar is. Yeah. OBJ to the Dolphins. Your thoughts there? That seems useful. That, that's a great take, Dan. That seems useful. <laughs> I feel like you just TLDR'd like a week of football contact. That seems useful is really all that needs to be said. Um, you guys know with the Dolphins, it's kind of felt like, okay, who is the third option, right? If you're facing these defenses that are, I don't know, playing these two high coverages or they're bracketing Tyreek Hill and there's a safety, how about Jalen Waddle? Somebody's open, but it, it has felt like there hasn't been that third option who is a reliable target for them, who works that short to intermediate uh, part of the field and gets yards after the catch. And I do think OBJ, while he's obviously not 2014 OBJ, he can do that. He can still take a slant for 20 yards if given space. He is a reliable third down target. He has good hands. He had very low drop rate in Baltimore. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, this massive, massive um, impactful change or addition rather, but I do think he is a useful player. I remain puzzled why the, Dol why the Dolphins didn't do more to address the offensive line, but I'm a broken record on that year after year after year. Um, but I do like that signing. Number one, the scene where the little kid tells Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who's the pilot, he's like, hey, aren't you Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? And then he's like, I'm Roger Murdoch. I'm Roger Murdoch. And then the kid's like, my dad says that you don't play very hard and like you don't run fast enough and you're and you're a bad player. You only and, show yeah. up in the playoffs. And, and then he you said, only show kid, up in the playoffs. yanks him in real close. He says, kid, <laughs> tell your old man to try carrying Lanier and Walton up the court every night. <laughs> It's so good. Lanier. Airplane, am I right, guys? He also, by the way, is such a – this is what I do remember. is such a good athlete. Act. Is he, like, one of the top five athlete oh, actors? Oh, that's, uh, that's the list that – I'm going to do that that's list That's a fun tomorrow. one. Ooh, Shaq's up there for sure. Uh, Mina, we have less than 30 seconds here. Do the Bears have the best wide receiver core in the NFL? No, I don't think they have the best wide receiver core. I still think the um, – there's some one-two punches that are ahead of them. Miami, Cincinnati, since Higgins is coming back. Um, and then, of course, the dude say is a rookie, but they're top faster, five. Faster, faster, You know what's funny? You're doing this. Can I tell you? Can I let you in on something? I actually haven't told you this for weeks. You've been playing the music. I don't hear it. 
for whatever reason, the audio isn't going through. So you've been doing this all like, no oh, original oh. Sound? it's actually not. It hasn't been coming into my head ears faster, for weeks, faster, and I just haven't faster, told you. Faster. You're saying that, and I don't. Oh, now I can hear it. Yeah. Okay. Damn, I shouldn't have told you. This is the Dan Lebatar show with the Stugats podcast.